everybody, and thanks for joining me. Um, it's been uh, quite a long year since uh, I left ATA, but we, um, I've, I've landed on my feet, and I've, um, you probably wondered where I disappeared to. I really did disappear to close to the end of the world, it seems like. A very, very isolated part of our country. Um, there's a, a few people here, I think, who aren't really associated with ATA, so um, just to let you know, I was ATA's executive director for 10 years, and um, in that time, we um, started our checklist database, launched that. We did that in 2014. We started our ambassador program. I personally attended over 100 um, stamp shows, mostly WSP, during my 10 and a half years with ATA. And we gathered 75 different ambassadors to represent ATA at shows. Um, we started a new website in 2010, very much needed um, updating. And I love the new website that ATA now has 10 years later. Um, I started the uh, Taste of Topicals program. Um, I edited about eight handbooks during my time with ATA. So it was a very busy job, but one of the busy parts was finding volunteers to try to take over much of the work that was formerly done by the executive director because just way too much for one person to try to do. So I'm happy to say that we now uh, have several of the programs in place and hopefully Jennifer, um, who's doing a fantastic job for ATA, will. Um, have a, a little stronger, um, uh, have a lot more time to work on the business of ATA because we have so many volunteers now that we didn't have before. So um, I'm really so proud to, uh, I was, to turn the reins over to Jennifer and I know she'll be doing a really good job for you. So Don asked me to uh, do a little program about what I've been up to in um, the last year or so, and um, let's see, I think I do share here. Okay, can everyone see this stamping and squim? Yes, we yes. can. Okay, thanks. So this is greetings from Sunny Squim. The reason I chose this place in one word is for the weather. It is so far away from my family or, um, or anything that I knew before, but it is one of the best weather places, a well-kept secret um, to the rest of the country. In addition to the weather, um, which the winter lows rarely go below 30. And last summer we got up to 82, two different days, but summers are usually in the 70s just idyllic and it is uh, it has a long 50 mile line of snow capped mountains they're snow capped about maybe 9 months of the year and it has dozens of miles of shoreline uh, with the ocean and the and the uh, strait of Juan de Fuca and the best and one of the other good parts is all the farms so many um, organic farms and uh, vegetable and fruit farms and all, and dairy farms. It's just a, a perfect place for me to retire to. Where in the world is Squim? As Eric mentioned, it's on the Olympic Peninsula, two hours or so west of Seattle. So Seattle is like over on the right in this um, slide. And uh, SeaTac Airport is uh, down toward uh, the southeast there, south of Seattle. And doesn't look like it's very far to Squim, which is kind of right here, if you can see my cursor. But it's a good two hour drive, no matter whether you do it by ferry or go around the roads. It's um, lots of barriers um, to travel in this part of the world. We are one hour east of the Pacific Ocean. And for you Midwesterners who always thought Seattle was on the ocean, no way. <laughs> it's a very long way inward from the ocean through the Strait of Juan de Fuca and down through the Puget Sound to get to Seattle. 
out here on the very point where the strait meets the Pacific Ocean is Cape Flattery. It's on the Macaw Indian Reservation and it's uh, the farthest Northwest tip of the continental US, of course, not including Alaska. And the green in the middle is Olympic National Park. The, way, the reason the weather is so good, not only the temperatures that I mentioned, but uh, Squim has only 16 inches of rain a year. If you go a mile east of Squim, it's 17, another mile is 18 and so forth. And west of Squim, it increases even more than that. But Squim itself is just 16 inches a year. This is because of the Olympic rain shadow you see Mount Olympus here um, is 220 inches a year and that's just over 50 miles away. But the mountains kind of stop the, all that rain that comes in from the ocean, the ocean storms, they, it sort of stops it or at least slows it down, turns it into a mist actually, because rain here is what I would call mist. <laughs> it just like never rains. Um, and so um, the mountains kind of slow the rain and you see Victoria, British Columbia, 20 miles across the strait. Um, the Strait of Juan de Fuca is also called the Salish Sea, especially in Canada. Uh, but 20 miles away in Victoria, the rain is like 24 inches a year. You see some other nearby towns, but then you get outside of this light circle on the map and you're up to 55, 60, 70, 80, you know, the rest of the area, the big general area is a lot um, more rainy than Squim. This is also kind of called the blue hole because of all the sunlight, um, 339 days of the year, the sun shines in Squim. So unabashedly in one word, I chose it for the weather. How does one say squim? I bet if we had a show of hands, probably 90% of us were saying sequim in our mind, and I wouldn't blame anybody for that at all. Uh, it comes, the word comes from the local uh, Native American tribe, the Scallum tribe, their word for hunting grounds. And here's what it sounds like in the, in the Indian language. I'll play that again. So it sounds like it ends in an N, doesn't it? The reason it's spelled squim is because of the post office. <laughs> because twice in the late 1800s, when the squim post office was being established, they wrote to the post office in Washington, D.C. to get their canceller, their first canceller, and twice it came back misspelled. So I do believe um, it is due to the post office that the town is named, called what it is today. And uh, it doesn't bear much relation to the local Indian language that it was really named after. So the Olympic Peninsula of Washington is that area west of the Puget Sound again, so Seattle is over off the map to the east, like here, um, and south from Squim. Squim is up here where um, this peninsula kind of juts out. The town is actually where my cursor is. But you can see the topography. It's very mountainous. Um, all through the Olympic Park, there are no roads through the mountains. You go around the edge of the mountains and there's various roads up into the edges, but there's no roads across the mountain ranges. Um, so there's just hundreds of miles of coastlines, lots of rivers and bays, sounds. The ferries um, hinder the transportation somewhat. Um, it's just a, the reason we're so isolated here is it just kind of takes a long time to get most anywhere, which keeps us um, nice and uh, I will say isolated from a lot of problems like the coronavirus, etc. cetera. Uh, we have three fast food restaurants in town and we have five other stores that you've heard of, 
like Starbucks and Walmart. But other than that, it's all local. Now, Mount Rainier, um, I just wanted to include this. This is not on the Olympic Peninsula. It's uh, located a little ways southeast of Seattle. But if you come to visit, you'll hopefully see uh, Mount Rainier on the way in um, on the plane. And um, also maybe when you're driving away from the airport, it's probably the best known landmark in Washington state. Therefore it rated its own stamp um, in, at New York 2016. This is one of the uh, beautiful stamps that was issued there uh, honoring like the night sky. We do have um, a view of the Cascade Mountains. Um, the Cascade Mountains are way out east of Seattle. So we're looking east in this picture, but this picture is local from here where you can see, see the bays and the islands of the Strait of Juan de Fuca looking east toward Mount Baker, which is in the Cascade Mountains east of Seattle. We're about an hour's drive from the Pacific Ocean. Um, if you're thinking ocean like the Atlantic, that's um, not true. Um, Pacific means, of course, calm. But we have uh, a lot more, I think, waves uh, in most of our beaches. And we don't have sand. That, it's pretty unusual on the, this part of the West Coast to have a sandy beach. It's more rocky, but it is probably more beautiful in many ways than the uh, East Coast beaches. Off the coast of the Pacific uh, Ocean, this area outlined in red on the right is the National Marine Sanctuary um, off the Olympic coast. And the headquarters for that is in Port Angeles, the next town to Squim. And it's of over 3,000 um, square miles of protected marine sanctuary. This is the iconic view of Olympic National Park called Hurricane Ridge. I just went there a couple days ago to see the first snow of, of this year on the mountaintops. Um, not as much as is quite as much as is shown in this picture, but uh, all the tops of all the mountains in Olympic Park are now covered with snow. And Hurricane Ridge um, is about 15 miles off of the highway speed limit about 35 miles an hour to get there, but you wouldn't want to go any faster than that. But it is well worth the drive. Just gorgeous, gorgeous scenery. More scenery from Olympic Park. Um, another one, there's a lot of um, poster stamp type ideas that are available at the Olympic, at the Olympic Park National Gift Shops like poster stamp from Lake Crescent Lodge here that I've shown on the right. There's both posters and poster stamps available at these places at the park. Um, more lovely scenery with some fall leaves. Um, the Salmon Run is just ending at Soul Duck, which is one of the small rivers that are in the park. And I got to see that for the first time a couple weeks ago. So, so, so gorgeous. Did you see the salmon at the bottom, uh, bottom right of the picture? I'll just save that little clip. So the salmon um, migrate, are migrating this time of year in that river uh, up to their spawning grounds and all, all the salmon that are, are, are climbing these tremendous rapids are going to die when they get up to the top. Um, but then that will feed the other animals in the park and help the cycle of life go on. So I was really pleased to see um, the salmon running for the first time in my life. Another view of Olympic National Park, another poster stamp. And when you're here, you'll want to bring your National Park's passport because the Olympic Park has eight different cancellations, which is pretty unusual. Most National Parks, I think, just have one. But this is such a um, 
widespread a, a park that you approach from many, many different angles all around the outside of it. So they've made different cancellations. That stamp on the cover is of Mount Rainier, um, not, not from the Olympic Park, but the cancellations are all from the park. This is the Ho Rainforest, which is on the west side of Olympic Park, closer to the ocean. 190 to 200 inches of rain each year. And it's a, a beautiful temperate rainforest, uh, one of the few in the world, really, um, and certainly the most accessible to people from the mainland US. Wonderful, wonderful hiking, and you won't even mind the rain. It's that beautiful. You just take your umbrella, and there's lots of wonderful short places to hike. The Pacific Coast Rainforest stamp sheet from 2000, you may remember, was um, issued for this area. Um, it might have, some of the animals might be from the Alaskan, the rainforest in Alaska too. I'm not exactly, I, I didn't check on that, but many of them are from the Ho rainforest. Now, out of the park, we're back to Squim, this small town of 6,000 people where I live. We're probably best known for, it's called the Lavender Capital, self-proclaimed, I will say. Uh, I know the um, Door County in Wisconsin, the Door Peninsula might like to, to uh, have a little fist fight with Squim about that, but I, we have 15 lavender farms here in Squim. And this wonderful lavender festival of toward the end of July each year. The Roosevelt elk um, are the only stamp that I could actually find that was like had anything to do with Squim itself because the Roosevelt elk live here. And this stamp is from that Pacific Coast rainforest sh um, stamp sheet I showed you, this 33 cent stamp for the Roosevelt elk. It's kind of a symbol of Squim because this herd named after Theodore Roosevelt lives here. Um, they don't have a sanctuary with fences. So their sanctuary it runs out like east to Squim to the north and also to the south. And it's probably the only elk herd in the country that has its own traffic signals because when the highway, Highway 101 uh, bypass was built around Squim in the late 1990s, it was slated to go through the path uh, that the elk often use in the elk in the sanctuary. So um, they, out, they fitted the elk with um, traffic control signals. And when they approach the highway, all of these flashing lights come on the highway and everyone knows to stop or slow down and watch for the elk. Uh, you don't have those same kind of signals on the country roads, but so when we're driving in that area, we often, we always watch for the elk because you never know when they're going to appear. I mentioned the, uh, um, the Indian tribe, the Scallum tribe, uh, which from which the name Squim was derived. It's a very strong presence in our community and very highly respected. They own the best medical center around, um, by far the best golf course around, wonderful dining spots. Uh, many, many, many businesses are owned by the tribe. Um, they're even in the process of trying to build a methadone clinic here to serve the people in the area. So um, the tribe is just a very um, strong presence in the community and really highly respected by all of us imports to the community. So right outside of, Sp of Squim to the north on the uh, strait or a uh, um, on the, along the coast is the Dungeness Wildlife National Wildlife Refuge and a very unusual feature called the Dungeness Spit, which runs 5.5 miles long. 
and one can start where it touches the mainland just off the map in the lower left corner here and hike or walk all the entire five and a half miles out to the end of the spit to the northeast there. There's a smaller spit that comes named the Klein spit that comes off of the dungeon of spit. It comes back down here fairly close back to the mainland. But this is a highly high, I believe it is the longest spit in the world and just a highly unusual um, feature. Here's a, an aerial view of the Dungeness Spit. Now this is taken from the east, from the point out at the end of the spit. So the spit runs all the way back there to where it touches the mainland. And then the smaller spit is here. So out toward the end of the spit is a lighthouse. Beautiful, beautiful lighthouse. I believe it was built in the very early 1900s. And you too can be a lighthouse keeper. The neat thing about this lighthouse is that um, four to eight people can rent this lighthouse. So you wouldn't be the lighthouse keeper all by yourself, but uh, two couples or a family group or a group of people, uh, I believe it's between four and eight people can um, be, you sign up to be a lighthouse keeper for one week. And it's a commitment. You're polishing brass, you are maybe mowing the lawn, uh, you're doing some minor upkeep on the lighthouse, um, making sure that the lighthouse is running as it should. But those are pretty minor duties um, and you have 24 hours a day to enjoy being basically out in the middle of the water, just at the end of this tiny spit of land. So um, you can find uh, more out about the Lighthouse Keeper program. By the way, uh, you would be um, taken to the Lighthouse, I believe it's a, a four-wheel drive vehicle that drives the length of the spit um, once a week to bring the new lighthouse keepers and retrieve the um, lighthouse keepers who've been there for a week. And um, then you're away from civilization for quite a while. Another view of the lighthouse. Uh, remember now we're on um, the Salish Sea or the Strait of Juan de Fuca, the main traffic way for all the ships to get into Seattle. So. Here is the USS John J. Stennis going by the lighthouse. Oh, excuse me here. Um, you'll also, when you're on the beaches of Squim or at the lighthouse, you'll see lots of cargo ocean ships, especially uh, post COVID when more goods are coming into our country. Um, you'll see um, cruise ships galore, but of course not this year because those aren't running but a lot of ocean traffic. Um, 20 miles across the way is Victoria, British Columbia. So you see the same ships that the Canadian people are seeing um, go through the Salish Sea. For you Deltiologists, here's an early postcard from the lighthouse. Um, it says Dungeness, Washington. That was the name of a small village near there that is now, um, just kind of a neat wide spot in the road with um, an old schoolhouse and a, a couple of businesses, but it's really now considered part of Squim. This is not exactly my type of tourism, but it is for some people. There's an Olympic game farm here at Squim where I believe, yes, you can even pet a bear if you're so interested. Um, again, it's a commercial establishment, um, good for that type of tourism, but. I, I've actually never been there, but it is a local, um, local uh, spot that a lot of people would visit. Now, I have been to this one, the Squim Farmer's Market. It runs on Saturdays, April through October. Lots and lots of lavender and lavender products for sale. Fantastic organic fruits and vegetables. Just a place not to be missed. Don also asked me to mention something about our local stamp collecting scene. 
So I thought I'd tell you about our straight stamp society. And it, uh, we usually have about um, 20 or so people at a meeting. Um, it's the first um, Thursday of each month at our library when our library is open. In December, Santa Claus is always there. One of our members is uh, highly active with the Marine uh, Toys for Tots program. So he's always there in costume. Um, excuse me, I went backwards accidentally there. Um, and now we are having Zoom meetings since our library is closed. Man. Um, the last one we had 12 people, including Scott English from the APS. Um, we kind of have a little different group than we do at our in-person meetings, but a couple of notable philatelists here, in addition to the ATA folks, Rick Coons is very active with the Mobile Post Office Society. So some of you may know Rick. Um, Roger Heath is um, a noted um, Swiss collector, does absolutely fantastic exhibiting. And then we are also a member is Jim Klotzel, who was editor in chief of Scott postage stamp catalogs for a lot of years. Uh, I believe his dad before him was also editor in chief. And uh, Jim was not at this Zoom meeting, but he is a fount of information and just a, a real wonderful addition to our stamp club. So we may be small here, but we really have some great philatelic things going on. We do have a local stamp show and our own Kathy Osborne is, um, she was the first chair of the show. She's still the chair of the show. We philatelists know how that works, right? Once we get a job, we somehow can't get rid of it. But Kathy has done such a great job with chairing our show ever since 1994, I think, when it was started. Here's some snapshots from our show. This is familiar to all of you, the, the cachet table at the local stamp club, at the local, local stamp show. I, I've seen these at many, many shows I've been to through the years when people are selling the cachets. And we do have exhibits, non, kind of non-competitive exhibits because our exhibit frames just hold six pages instead of 16. But um, everyone, a lot of people in the club like to, show, to do an exhibit for the show um, as a step per, to perhaps getting into um, the, judge, the judging part of exhibiting later. So I mentioned, I mentioned we do um, cachets for the show. Uh, here's just some samples. Uh, one year, the lighthouse was featured. Another year, the Dungeness Crab, along with the uh, old school I mentioned at the village of Dungeness. The Dungeness Crab actually um, was named for the area around the Dungeness Spit and the Dungeness River, which empties there. And, but it ranges all the way from the Aleutians down to San Francisco, but the center is sort of around Squim. Great crab eating here. Um, there was a mastodon uh, discovered on the outskirts of Squim, I think around 40 or so years ago. And uh, there's a big exhibit about that in our local history museum that was commemorated by our show one year. And very important, the, the uh, second cachet here, the MV Coho, that is our local ferry that leaves from Port Angeles, the next town, and it takes us over to Victoria, British Columbia. Of course, with the um, Canadian border closed to um, Americans right now because of COVID, the ferry then is not running. But that, that ferry is very important to our show because when we have our show, we have many philatelists from Victoria who ride over on the ferry. Our local club provides the transportation from Port Angeles to the show. We have many, many Canadian collectors who come to the show, the local stamp show here in Squim. Incidentally, the show is uh, around of the second weekend of August each year, give or take a week or two. 
Another activity of our club, the, this town, I, I've been to a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, post offices in our country during my years in philately. Never have I seen such a beautiful way for a stamp club to share collecting with the members of the community. So in this upper photo here, you see there are um, standalone, <coughs> excuse me, um, standalone display cases where the stamp club can, can put displays. There's room for 16 pages altogether. And it's right where everyone is walking through the post office, standing in line to get up to the counter. So we have wonderful, wonderful exposure for our hobby. <coughs> Excuse me. This uh, particular display that we have in now uh, honors the um, essential workers. Um, so um, the postal workers, the nurses and medical personnel, EMTs and so forth. Um, that was put up um, after COVID started. So we have five uh, members of ATA in our local stamp society. I mentioned Kathy Osborne before. She's, I think, our longest serving member. Um, Kathy is known as the, well, as the North American Vice President for the Motive Group Music, which is ATA's study unit for music. It's headquartered in Germany. And Kathy's main collection is on bells. So she provided these items for me to show you from her collection. Um, that Liberty Bell, early Liberty Bell stamp um, was Kathy's first bell stamp that she ever had in her collection. And um, it, it's, it's one of her favorites, although um, she now has thousands more favorites, I believe in her collection. This cover in the upper right is a Swiss cover with a cow and a cowbell. Wonderful concordance with the um, postmark as so many of the European countries do. And one of Kathy's favorite uh, philatelic items is this postal history item at the bottom. It has three different um, connections to her bell collection, um, both the uh, um, the corner card cachet, the um, Isbell's bulb and seed in Jackson, Michigan, and the um, perfect. Our newest ATA member in our club is Dick McCammon. Um, he's our newsletter editor, our club webmaster, all around good guy. Every stamp club needs somebody like Dick in it. And Dick collects um, unusual top, unusually shaped stamps uh, and especially likes embroidered stamps. So he provided, provided me this little um, uh, selection from his collection that he enjoys on the embroidered stamps. He's a brand new ATA member. Judy Newbloom has um, been an ATA member probably about as long as she's been in SQUIM, I think. Um, she started out with collecting lighthouses. She's been active in the uh, Lighthouse Society here. Um, she and her husband both. And um, I first met Judy in Omaha at um, the um, Great Amer at the stamp show last year in Omaha with ATA and, and APS. Um, so the lighthouse part of her collection is represented here by this a new issue coil strip from Germany. But Judy's really gotten, she's branched out a lot in, now into collecting women astronauts and aviators. Um, Harriet Quimby is here on this cachet in the uh, upper right. And the astronauts, um, Mae Jemison on the, the cachet on the left, and then Sally Ride on this um, souvenir sheet from Mozambique. And of course, the US also issued a Sally Ride stamp recently. So Judy is um, preparing an exhibit now on the women aviators, and we all look forward to seeing that soon. Angela Watson is a member of ATA and um, a chicken farmer. And so her topic is very much related to her farm. Um, 
And I've shown here some of her favorite items. Um, she loves this souvenir sheet from France. And then two postal history items. The uh, top one, the cachet is actually in the shape of the uh, head of the chicken. It's like a cutout. And then the bottom postal history item is from Quincy, Illinois. Hello, Sue Bruce. Um, it's from a company uh, in Quincy that made um, incubators and uh, brooders and that type of thing. And Angela tells me that she really loves this cachet because of the brilliance, the brightness of the yellow dye that was used in printing. Um, that, that some of the early yellows have very, very much faded over time. And yellow is kind of a problematic color, I guess, in postal history cachets. But this one has remained bright through the years. And our last ATA member is me. You don't need to picture me because you're looking at me right now. <laughs> but um, I love this Cayman Islands. It's a fairly recent um, booklet. And the cover of the booklet uses um, uh, sa sand stars. Uh, and it, they have made them into little gingerbread dancers. And then I show a, a Danish stamp from 2015, Gingerbread Girl. And then this is... Um, Mary Kay Fisher cover, uh, one of my favorite uh, hand-painted covers showing a gingerbread house. I also collect other herbs and spices and other gastronomy type things and also um, anti-smoking, uh, anti-drugs, um, uh, anti-alcohol, that type of thing. So Don said, be sure and talk about what you're doing in retirement. If you recognize this little gingerbready stamp here, that's um, for quite a while, Wayne Youngblood used that um, for my Vera's Views column in Topical Time. The centerpiece of my life in Squim so far hasn't been stamps. It has been this place called Nutritious Movement. And for those of us who are getting like a little bit um, older than we would like or stiffer than we would like, oh, I really recommend this website to you. Um, Katie Bowman lives here in Squim. She's moved here from California where she was centered. She's written eight or 10 books and she runs this uh, little um, studio called Nutritious Movement where one can take classes pre-COVID um, so our classes this summer have been at a lavender farm and our classes now are being held at the um, Finn River um, farm and cidery. They, they produce hard cider for the squim market and a little bit beyond squim, I think. But this is the most wonderful kind of thing to participate in. It is not exercise. It is not Pilates. It is not yoga. The, the best way I can explain it is stretching your muscles uh, that you've long ago lost, because if you've been sitting at a computer like I have for so many years, or you've gotten out of shape, this gal really knows how to help you get your muscles back in shape. So she, this has really become the centerpiece of my life in Squim. I did not even know it existed before I got to Squim although I had uh, read her book before. So, but I do have stamps still in my life, of course. Um, I have a new topic called lavender. Um, it obviously because of the lavender fields here um, and this being called the lavender capital. So through the ATA checklist, I've identified about 21 or 22 stamps. Um, that uh, are lavender in nature or show the lavender plant. And uh, these are the ones I have so far still looking, as you know, the thrill is in the hunt. And uh, there's one cover that I know of uh, from our local stamp club here on lavender with the lavender postmark. And new project for me, um, the Squim Lavender Festival 
It has been in existence about 24 years now. And they commission a poster, they commission poster art each year um, from uh, artists all around the Northwest. So there have been 23 and three fourths posters now. Um, the bottom right one was the artwork had been chosen for this year's Lavender Festival, which had to be canceled because due to COVID. So um, there are like now about close to 24 lavender posters through the years. So my idea is to make a um, Cinderella sheet from all the lavender posters through the years, um, have them printed by um, a Portland stamp company, uh, which uh, will produce uh, special sheets of stamps that are perforated and glued and so forth. Nico Cortilas uh, manages that. Some of you probably know Nico. And um, so this is kind of my goal. Next time there's a lavender festival, our stamp club can participate, raise some money, perhaps by selling these sheets for the lavender festival, raise some money for the festival and then we can get um, some publicity for our stamp club too. So um, as a Northwest philatelist, I participated in CPEX um, in the past somewhat and more now. Um, CPEX was founded by ATA's own Jack Congrove, who we lost earlier this year. He, he passed away unexpectedly in April. He was the founder of CPEX, the WSP show that's in Seattle, and he was a long time, um, I should have said second vice president of ATA. My apologies, I made an error on that slide. He was ATA's second vice president. And um, Carol Edholm, also active in ATA and a great ambassador for us. Um, is the um, now the president of CPEX replacing Jack. So she spearheaded the first virtual WSP show, World Series of Philately show this year, um, about a month ago. And it is still online. If you haven't had a chance to go and check it out, you really should. Um, it's only going to be online till the end of the month. So uh, when you go to cpexshow.org, click on exhibits, click on presentations, click on meetings, you're gonna find lots to do with uh, topical collecting. And um, there's, I've given you the first page of all the topical and thematic related exhibits. You can see the entire exhibit online at cpexshow.org. Um, we had Scooby-Doo by Carol Costa, uh, Blowing Off Steam um, from Larry Crane. Um, Keith Edholm did his wonderful camel exhibit. Um, John Hammond's cabbage exhibit. Um, I think this lower left one is um, Ann Harris's exhibit. Um, and then the next one is Anand Kakad. He's an ATA member from India. This is a wonderful gold medal winning, uh, FIP gold medal, gold medal winning exhibit. Be sure to check these out. Um, Apollo 11 by Eric Knapp and um, Nancy, um, losing Lance, Nancy's last name, I have it written down here, Nancy Swan. Uh, has an exhibit on the Tour de France. Um, so that's the, the eighth um, topically, topical related exhibit that is still um, up, up for view at cpexshow.org. Um, for ATA, I've been doing some volunteer work for our Taste of Topicals program, which I kind of started a few years ago. And Barbara Asher is now the volunteer uh, the, the in charge of the program, wonderful volunteer for ATA. To order the Taste of Topicals, you need to contact Jennifer at the ATA office. But February, March of this year, I redid all 400 album pages for, or I, I, I did many for the first time. And um, Amy Devine, 
who uh, has done the youth album pages for ATA. She's our assistant youth coordinator for ATA. Um, Amy had used several different uh, backgrounds uh, through the years in creating album pages. So I put them all on the very same background. So they're all a little bit more coordinated now for our Taste of Topicals. And Barbara and I guess me together, we've added um, a lot of uh, more adult topics to the topical album pages, things on current currency and economics and libraries and all kinds of more adult topics that we don't have on our youth page. Um, the other thing I do for ATA is I proofread topical time each every two months for Wayne Youngblood. Um, I did that when I worked for ATA. Wayne's asked me to continue. So anyway, I'm still keeping my little, my little fingers and helping ATA along the way because I know how important volunteers are to our organization. So life in SQUIM. I first moved to a rental house and the um, left picture here is outside my kitchen window with my daily visitors grazing in the backyard and my little Lennox um, China gingerbread collection in my kitchen window. And on the right is some of the little gingerbreads that I did for Christmas for last year. That project will be starting up again real soon here, I fear. Um, then I had to move again, or I chose to move again because I'd moved 2,306 miles from Illinois um, the end of October last year. And, but I loved my little house, but my landlord wasn't willing to sell. So I decided I was going to be here a long enough time I needed to buy a house. So this is in my old garage, some of the packing that I did, um, getting ready to move to my new house. On the right um, is my view of snow-covered mountains from my new living room window. So dearly, dearly love, I'm so privileged to have this house and the view that I have. And I actually have a view of another mountain out the, the other side of my living room windows. So some life in SQUIM, the right picture, I talked about the crab being so important here. We christened my new kitchen by uh, cooking a live crab. Um, so that was a little traumatic experience, especially for my grandson and his little friend who were visiting, but we did manage it. I didn't have a crab pot, but I did have a pan that was big enough to hold it. Uh, that's my daughter, uh, daughter's hands holding the crab. And on the left, my mailbox is right across the street from my house with a carpet of cherry blossoms under it. Um, it's, there are a lot of cherry blossom trees on my street and it just turns the whole place pink uh, when they fall in the spring. So that's my mailbox. A couple more pictures of some of the scenery in my family, my grandson playing in what he calls Puget Sound, which is really the Salish Sea, straight to Juan de Fuca, and that is Mount Baker off in the background there. And this island here um, near Squim, 70% of the sea birds uh, in the entire Puget Sound area are born on this island. So lots of wildlife around here. And this right picture was just this week when we went to Hurricane Ridge, my 18 year old grandson is a fresh virtual freshman at Georgetown majoring in physics. And he's here for about three weeks. Um, he's studying virtually. He's taken over my stamp room and it's been here, his for three weeks now, but it's been great to have him here studying and living. And this is my eight year old grandson and my daughter. So more grandchildren pictures. Hudson uh, with a piece of kelp that was um, washed up on the shore at Port Williams here uh, near Squim. Um, the upper right picture is my son and his nephew, my grandson, and the other two. This picture in the bottom right is at the uh, railroad bridge on the Dungeness River, which uh, runs through the edge of Squim and uh, empties out 
um, to the Salish Sea. And last fun picture, um, my neighbor Cliff has a um, tandem trike. He's a cyclist, but he has a tandem trike. So when you ride on it, it's geared on both wheels and we can ride on it and he can work harder than I can, but we can still enjoy all the scenery around Squim, including the snow covered mountains right, right outside my house. Now we hope to get to the last slide, which this has been stamping and squim. Just a few pieces of my life here, including ATA, CPEX, our local stamp club, and of course my gingerbread collection. So thanks for enjoying a little bit of squim. I hope you enjoyed it with me. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to talk.